Welcome to our video lecture on topic D2.3, water potential. Our guiding questions for today, what factors affect the movement of water into and out of cells, and how do plant and animal cells differ in the regulation of water movement? Our objectives, we're going to describe the process of solvation, how stuff dissolves. We're going to look specifically at how stuff dissolves in water. We're going to define osmosis and hypertonic and hypotonic and isotonic. We're going to describe how dialysis tubing can be used to model osmosis. And we're going to outline the importance of those isotonic solutions for medical applications. We call water the universal solvent because lots of stuff, not the whole universe, but lots of stuff dissolves pretty well in it. The reason that stuff dissolves well in water is because water is polar. Water is polar because it has a slightly positive side where the hydrogens are, slightly negative side where the oxygen is because oxygen is more electronegative than is the hydrogen pulling those electrons closer to it. When something ionic like sodium chloride or salt dissolves in water, what's happening is this. These positive cations of sodium, remember that cat sodium is a metal, it's going to lose electrons more easily than it gains electrons. That makes it positive, and cations are positively charged. What happens is that sodium, which is positively charged, is going to be attracted to the negative side of the water molecules where the oxygen is. And then, because opposites attract, we end up with this whole bubble of water surrounding that sodium cation, and then that whole bubble of water can float around in the water, and that cation is dissolved. Similar thing happens with the chloride anion. Chloride is an anion because it's negatively charged. It gains electrons. The electrons sodium loses get gained by, by chloride. Chloride's an anion. I did not write that very well. Um, and then chloride also gets surrounded by a bubble of water, except instead of it being the oxygen negative side, like with sodium, now it's going to be the positive hydrogen side. Because again, opposites attract. Chloride is negatively charged. Those hydrogen sides are partially positive, And then we end up with this lovely bubble of water around the chloride. This molecule over here is glucose. Glucose does not quite ionize, turn into ions, the way that sodium chloride does, but it does also dissolve in water, but a little bit differently. Again, we have our positive and negative sides of the water. Water is polar. This oxygen is going to make this little piece of the glucose molecule a little bit negative. This oxygen's a little bit negative. This oxygen's a little bit negative. All of these oxygens are just a little bit negative. And so what can happen is the hydrogen side of the water molecule, the hydrogen side of the water molecule is going to be attracted to those negative oxygens in the glucose. And then we end up again with a little bubble of water, different this time, not quite as well surrounded uh, because the glucose is not breaking apart into little pieces, but we can still put these water molecules because of these forces of attraction, these hydrogen bonds between the water and the glucose, we can put this bubble of water around the glucose and glucose can also dissolve in the water. Things like Mm, lipids. So if we drew a fatty acid, which is carbon with a double bonded oxygen and then oxygen and hydrogen, and then we have all those carbons and some hydrogens. So many hydrogens. We do have some space on this part of the molecule where water could be attracted, but water is not going to be attracted to any part of that hydrocarbon chain. We call it hydrocarbon because it's a, a, a chain composed of hydrogens and carbons. This hydrocarbon chain is not going to be attracted to the water. And so things like oils, this fatty acid, do not dissolve very well in water at all. Osmosis is the movement of water across a membrane. But what's interesting is we don't talk about 
water moving from high water concentration to low water concentration because then we would have to calculate how water is dissolved in the water and that doesn't make much sense. Concentration or molarity is calculated by finding the number of moles of a solute, the stuff that is dissolved in the water, by the volume or liters of the whole solution. I can't really say, well, I've got two moles of water dissolved in one liter of water. That doesn't make any sense. So we can't really talk about the concentration of water. It's a pure liquid. It's not dissolved in anything itself. So, so what we do instead is we talk about the concentration of the solute that's in the water. So here, look at all my water molecules. So much water. The solute is a very low solute concentration. On this side of my semi-permeable membrane, semi-permeable because some things can cross and some things cannot, my semi-permeable membrane here, the solute piece is in purple. They're too big to go that way because the membrane is semi-permeable. Stuff can't get across if it's too big. What happens instead, these water molecules will move from where we have the low solute concentration to where we have a higher solute concentration. The water will move from low solute concentration over the membrane to the high solute concentration in order to change those those balances try to dilute all the solute that we have over here that doesn't match what we have over here we have this super cool stuff called dialysis tubing dialysis tubing and we use it to model osmosis we can show how water moves across a membrane a semi-permeable membrane by using these dialysis tubes so here we can see that we have our water molecules in this beaker and then inside the dialysis tubing we have a couple different things we have some big things maybe that's like a protein and then we have some little things maybe that's like glucose What's kind of cool, the glucose is small enough, it's able to pass through the dialysis tubing membrane. And so we can see that we've got some glucose that's moved out. The glucose is going to move out of the dialysis tubing until we get to equilibrium, where we have equal concentrations of glucose outside and inside. Interestingly, the glucose doesn't stop moving after we get to equilibrium, but instead it just trades places. So this glucose might move in and this glucose will move out. And so we don't have uh, uh, no movement, but instead we have what we call dynamic equilibrium. Things move in and out equally. So the overall concentration stays the same, even though the specific molecules don't stay the same. Notice though that those proteins, those proteins, have not moved out. They're too big. They can get across that membrane because our membrane is once again semi-permeable. And so what happens instead? Water is going to go in. So notice that over on this side, we only had water on the outside of the membrane, but now we've definitely had some water moving into the membrane. So water will move in, try to dilute that protein that's on the inside because here is where we have our high solute concentration, a low solute concentration on the outside of the membrane. Water moving across a membrane, a semi-permeable mem membrane, from high solute concentration to low solute concentration is osmosis. We've got a little bit more vocabulary to go along with this idea of osmosis. Hyper is high. Kind of like when you're feeling hyper, you have high amounts of energy. Hypo rhymes with low. Hypertonic solutions have high solute concentrations. Hypotonic solutions have low solute concentrations. Sometimes we use these braces. Uh, square parentheses to 
abbreviate the idea of a concentration. So high solute concentration would be hypertonic. Low solute concentration is hypotonic. And so if I have an animal cell that I've plopped into a hypertonic solution, that means that I've got more, let's say we have sugar this time. I have more sugar outside the cell than I have inside the cell because I have a higher concentration of sugar outside the membrane, water is going to move from the cell to out of the cell because I have a higher concentration outside. And the water moves from a lower concentration to higher concentration because the water is leaving the cell. The cell is going to lose volume. There's less water inside the cell. It's going to lose mass because we have less water inside the cell. Sometimes we call this shriveled. A better word is actually crenelated. Oops, that's a U, hold on. Crenulated. So crenulated um, or wrinkly is what these cells end up looking like. In a, in a hypotonic solution, in a hypotonic solution, so maybe now we have just distilled water, all distilled water outside the cell. Um, oops, I lost the H there. Uh, all distilled water outside the cell. So now my high solute concentration is what we have inside the cell, and we have low solute concentrations outside. So all the sugar is in the cell now. What's going to happen is the water is going to move from low to high. Water is going to flow into the cells. And this is really bad for us animal cells because we don't have a cell wall. And so what can happen is, notice this poor little cell right here, it could explode or lice. So these cells can become lysed. They explode because they have too much water in them. The pressure inside the cell is too large for the plasma membrane to hold all the stuff in, and it just pops. So that's bad for, for us animal cells. Where we like to be, the, the magic in the middle is isotonic. Iso is equal. Again, this is an, a dynamic, dynamic equilibrium. When we have these isotonic solutions so we have equal sugar inside and outside and so the water will move in and out at an equal rate so we don't have any changes in volume no changes in mass this is the best thing for us animal cells we really like isotonic solutions interestingly plant cells do not plant cells love a good hypotonic solution because they've got that amazing cell wall. So, so in a hypotonic solution, again, we have a higher concentration of solute inside the cell, lower concentration, because it's hypo and po rhymes with low, lower concentration outside the cell. So water will move into that plant cell. But because it's got that amazing cell wall, it's going to stay nice and fluffy and happy. So this is the happy place for plant cells. Plant cells like to be in a hypotonic solution. They have this thing called turgid pressure, which just makes them, again, full and fluffy, and their stems are super upright. This is the best thing for plants. A little bit bad for plants is an isotonic solution. The plants become flaccid, so they're not super big and fluffy. That pressure is not quite as high, and they start to wilt. This is not a good thing for our plant cells. The worst thing for the plant cells is a hypertonic solution. And what's going to happen is that water, because we have a high concentration outside, lower concentration inside the cell, water is going to leave the cell. And it can actually leave so much that the cell membrane starts to pull away from the cell wall. And we call this plasmalized, and this is the saddest place for plant cells. Plants do not like this at all. This guy is a protist, one of our single-celled organisms that lives in plants. It is eukaryotic, eukaryotic, but unicellular. And so it does have a nucleus, it does have membrane-bound organelles, but because it's unicellular, all of the functions of life need to happen in this one cell. Remember that this guy, paramecium, has this super cool contractile vacuole. 
it lives in a pond. There's more water outside the pond. There's a high solute concentration inside the cell. And so water is going to move into the paramecium all the time because he lives in a pond. What happens is that water gets pushed into the contractile vacuole. The contractile vacuole gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it squirts all that water out. And more water goes in because it's still a hypotonic solution on the outside of the cell. Lower concentration of salts and sugars and proteins outside the cell. So water will go in again, again, and again, and then it collects it in that contractile vacuole and squirts it out. So the paramecium, even though it doesn't have a cell wall, can prevent itself from being lysed with that amazing contractile vacuole. Let's practice a little bit predicting what's going to happen to our dialysis tube. So again, we have some dialysis tubing to help us model osmosis. If I have it's very small letters. That reads one molar. We measure concentration in molarity. If I have one molar starch in my beaker and distilled water in my dialysis tube, let's identify hypertonic, hypotonic. So where do I have the hypertonic solution? That's the beaker because there's more higher concentration of stuff outside the cell than inside the cell. So this is going to be a hypertonic solution because the concentration outside the cell is higher than inside the cell or the dialysis tube. Because we have a higher concentration outside, water is going to move from low to high solute concentration. Because we have zero solute concentration in that distilled water, the water is going to move out of the dialysis tube. The dialysis tube's mass will go down. The volume will also go down. What about beaker number two? So now we have one molar starch solution inside my dialysis tube, distilled water outside. Because we have a higher solute concentration inside the dialysis tube, the outside environment is going to be hypotonic because it's lower than inside the cell. What's going to happen now? The water is going to move into the dialysis tube and the mass and the volume of the tube is going to increase. What about this guy? So now instead of dialysis tube, I've got a chunk of potato, uncooked potato, little piece of potato in this beaker of sugar. So we have 0.25 molar sucrose. What if the potato also has 0.25 molar sucrose concentration inside its cells? What's going to happen? How do I describe these solutions? They're equal, and remember that our vocabulary for equal was isotonic. So we have equal concentrations inside and out. Does that mean no water is going to move in or out of those potato cells? It does not, because remember that we have dynamic equilibrium. So what's going to happen is water is going to move in and out at equal rates. We will have no change in mass or volume. We will have different water molecules inside and outside of the potato cells, but we won't have any net change in the mass or the volume because it's equal and animal cells really like equal. We take advantage of this idea of isotonic solutions in medicine. We have what we call normal saline. Normal saline is 0.9% sodium chloride. This is equal to the salt concentration of our bodies. And so this saline solution we use for um, IV bags. We use it for eye drops. We use it when we have organs that need to be transplanted. Those organs, this happens to be a kidney. That kidney is in a, an isotonic solution of salt water because our bodies are kind of salty. And we don't want water moving into those kidney cells and making them explode before our patient gets them. We don't want the kidney cells to lose water because the kidney is not he healthy. 
We definitely want to put the healthiest of kidneys into our patients. And so our transplants are going to be bathed in isotonic solution to keep them nice and happy, that dynamic equilibrium. Here's one of those um, IV bags. So this one is a banana bag. Um, so it has not just that 0.9% uh, sodium chloride saline solution, but this guy also has some vitamins and some sugar in the form of glucose, um, maybe some proteins, whatever else it is that that patient needs. Uh, it's going to get loaded up into their body through this IV bag, um, this banana bag, and banana because it's yellow. It also has a lot of potassium, just like bananas. All right, my friends, we did it. Uh, guiding questions answered. Factors that affect the movement of water into and out of cells. It's all about those solute concentrations. And then how do plant and animal cells differ in their regulation? Well, plant cells have a cell wall. Animal cells explode. That's bad. Um, our objectives. We talked about this process of salivation because water is polar. The positive hydrogen sides will be attracted to the negatively charged anions in the solute. The negatively charged oxygen side of the water molecule will be attracted to the positively charged cations. Osmosis is that movement of water across a membrane, but it's kind of weird because we're going from high solute concentration to low solute concentration. We don't talk about the concentration of water because that doesn't make any sense. Hypertonic, we have a high concentration of that solute. Hypo rhymes with low. We have a low solute concentration. Iso is equal. We described how dialysis tubing can be used to model osmosis. We can look at how the, the dialysis tubing can change in mass and volume when that water is moving. And then we talked about the importance of those isotonic solutions to medical applications because us animal cells, we love an isotonic environment. Good work today, my friends.